Welcome to Key 6, Appropriate Attendance. We've mentioned that managers can have to, up to 60 meetings a month and that managers believe half of them are a waste of time. So why on earth do meetings continue to dominate the top spot for time wasting? Well, apart from the observable fact that humans like hanging out with humans, have you noticed how many people sit in cafes, coffee shops, using laptops, tablets, they're working away on their own stuff, not talking to anyone else. They just seem to take some sort of comfort by being surrounded by other people. Slightly more scientifically, we give great value to our sense of acceptance and belonging in groups. This has been pretty obvious since caveman times. But humanist and psychologist Will Schultz came up with the FIRO model in 1958, Fundamental Interpersonal Relations Orientation. It's been used by countless organizations to assess team interaction. It measures the degrees of inclusion, affection, and control in group members. And we need to belong, and we need to be accepted, or feel like we do. There was even a Harvard Business Review study, I think, that talked about the fact that managers actually like going to meetings, despite their apparent protests. And isn't it true for all of us that it counts for quite a lot to be invited to and included in a decision-making team who want you at the table? So we know it's important to belong and to be accepted and to have status. These things seem to work at a subconscious level and they can influence a person's conscious logic when it comes to accepting a meeting invitation or not. There's also the fact that the grapevine is one of the best ways to keep up to date in a complex matrix organization. Meetings certainly fulfill that role. So most people's default position is that they'll simply accept a meeting invite for all the above reasons. So for truly efficient meetings, the meeting owner needs to decide who should attend and who should not. As owner, per keys one and two, you're making your decision on the likely value of that person's contribution to that specific meeting to obtain that specific outcome. If you need a tough decision, for instance, do you have people there with the actual authority to decide, and so on. So the invitation isn't made just because they are a manager or have a title that seems to automatically include them. This can be a bit of a cultural leap for some organizations, what you do with them once they're there is another matter. Appropriate attendance implies appropriate participation. It's worth repeating. You only want them there if they can materially contribute to obtaining the meeting's outcome. A big part of appropriate attendance and proper participation is to make sure that each member in the meeting gives complete focus to the job at hand. That's not an easy task when 75% of us, yes, 75%, you know who you are, try to sneakily do a bit of our own work during a meeting. The people who do try and do their own work and at the same time attend to what's being said in the meeting would be horrified and astounded to read the degree of incompetence associated with multitasking. You know, you can't even hold a conversation with someone in a car who is talking to you if you have to perform a difficult navigational task. In the case of certain types of complex thinking, you can't even walk and talk at the same time. You literally have to stop. So a part of appropriate attendance is that you choose people who not only can contribute to the outcome, but people who agree to focus on it. If the outcome is right and the right people are chosen, they are in fact much more likely to focus anyway. And we all respect phone-free areas when we need to. Airplanes, hospitals, funerals, theatres, film shows, to name a few. A good chairperson, the owner and facilitator of the meeting, simply does not allow personal mobile technology to be used during meetings. The people who do arrive on time, have prepared and do pay attention, will want and expect you to facilitate a good distraction-free meeting. What are good facilitators? Well, most people agree that they usually remain neutral, listen carefully and expertly. 
and encourage the views, ideas, feedback and opinions of every person present. They manage conflict and they keep to the agenda. Per key one, your primary objective as facilitator is to make sure the people in the meeting achieve the meeting's stated objective, the meeting's outcome. When you find and stake the right outcome at the start, you usually quite easily find which type of meeting it is. And so you'll know the type of participation required from that, who to invite, who to leave out. All of that somewhat takes care of the task and process elements of this mini team event. The relationship side is principally a people management exercise, understanding the personality characteristics of each person present and their likely strengths and weaknesses, and that can be a helpful tool in the facilitator's bag of tricks. We'll expand on these personality characteristics in session eight, who's in your meeting. Understanding the various models that explain them, and despite the fact they are just models, not absolute science, they should provide good help to you. Certainly to control the diverse communication, to keep the agenda going, and to accomplish the outcome. And all the while making your appropriate participants feel included and valued. Thanks for watching. Key 7 is all about action the after-meeting action plan that makes your meeting worthwhile.